Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. Now I'm going to bring in tonight as our guest, uh, the Unshackled's Associate Editor Lucas Roses, I call him and our Antifa hitman. Uh, he's been following uh, Marxist, uh, left-wing, extremist, anarchist uh, groups, not just in, in the past five years, but over many decades. So obviously what's happened with uh, Stephen Jolly being forced out of the Victorian uh, socialist, uh, he can give us a complete rundown on Stephen Jolly's history and, of course, the events that uh, have brought uh, his uh, Victorian socialist experiment uh, to an end. And we're also going to uh, ask him about a few other uh, left-wing extremist uh, developments. So, Lucas, great to talk to you again. Fantastic to be back, Tim, and congratulations on the new format. It's looking fantastic so far. Yes, thank you. I've really enjoyed uh, the, uh, doing Wilms Front uh, so far, this live, fast-paced uh, format. I'm covering news uh, as it breaks, and obviously uh, what's happened with Stephen Jolly, it broke on, on Monday night. They The Age jumped it on, on Brownlow night. I don't know if Jolly was, was watching the Brownlow, because I know he's a, he's a big footy fan, and he got the, the Yarra Council back in 2017 to support the, the Richmond Tigers in the grand final. Yeah, he's doing something similar about it today. Uh, which uh, this year with the Richmond being in the grand final this weekend as well, which is an interesting thing. It's always nice to see that people have more of a human side, even if they're human trash. <laughs> yeah. Well, Stephen Jolly, he's he he's an old school socialist, uh, to, uh, to put it that way. I mean, he is 57 years old, near near about. Uh, he's he's been around the the scene for decades, and and certainly we focus on uh, the young ones these days, the the radical anti capitalist, the the feminist, the the LGBT one. But Jolly is actually he he has a lived experience as a as a working class man. He's he's raised a a family. He's basically what old labour used to be. Oh, more like what old extreme left used to be. I mean, <laughs> even even by the standards of old Labour, he would still be on the extreme left. I mean, he has been a Trotskyist for his entire adult life, and he's been an activist for his entire adult life. I mean, we can go a little bit into his history right now, if that's okay with you? Yeah, well, uh, let's go back right to when he was born. He was uh, born in, in London to an Irish uh, single uh, mother, and uh, so... That, that's where his life began, and uh, obviously his his mother was a, an unwed uh, Irish Catholic, and so he already had faced from that young age uh, s some form of oppression from a hierarchical authority. Yeah, and the more the fact that when he was born, uh, as was not a particularly uncommon thing at the time, if you go back that far, uh, his grandma, he was told that his grandmother was his mother and that his mother was his sister. And his uh, mother was fairly quickly bundled away and uh, he didn't find out the truth until he was in his teenage years. And at that stage he followed his mother to South Africa where she had moved and he actually finished his schooling and his uh, university, he did his university degree in uh, the University of Cape Town under apartheid South Africa which is a very interesting sort of thing there, just sort of his formative years. Right? An Irish guy who was born in London and finished his education in South Africa. And he certainly wasn't sort of, even though he came from a very traditional working class, sort of living in a house estate background, uh, that wasn't really sort of the experience of his formative years. And when he'd finished his schooling, he came back to Ireland. And, um, look, you were talking about the fact that he's an old-style socialist, an old-style Trotskyist in that sort of uh, that tradition. And that's 100% true. He was part of, in Ireland, the, the militant group, what was called the militant tendency. People who are older listeners might actually remember them from the 1980s. They were the ones who were causing so much trouble in and around Liverpool at the time. They actually tried to, they were almost at the point of um, make, attempting to take over the Labour Party during the Thatcher years. There was some of the huge sort of splits and internal fighting that they caused which helped Thatcher to stay in power for as long as she did because they had just so many activists. They'd completely taken over the, um, the youth 
uh, wing of the British Labour Party back in the 1970s. And they like continued that hold over it until the late 80s, early 90s, when they all decided to leave. But um, so Jolly was in the Irish wing of that, which was attempting to do the same thing in Ireland with less success. And um, that in the middle of the early to sort of early to mid 1980s, they started sending missionaries overseas to uh, colonise socialist parties and that sort of stuff um, in different countries. And they, they had some success of this, the militant tendency. Like in uh, Sri Lanka, they managed to pretty much um, sort of affiliate the largest sort of extreme left party in Sri Lanka to themselves. And uh, they also, in Sweden, they got kicked out. In a lot of countries, they got kicked out because they'd seen the experience of how much trouble the British Labour Party was having and they saw them coming a mile away. And in Australia, they managed to, when Stephen showed up here, they managed to take over a few Labour Party branches. And they, uh, but they didn't have a huge amount of success because they only had a limited amount of activists here. And when Stephen first came here, he was in Sydney. And in between coming to Australia, he'd uh, gone back to Africa. Supposedly, he was a part of the underground resistance against Mugabe in Zimbabwe. Um, he'd uh, ducked in between coming up to Australia. He'd ducked up to um, China for the Tiananmen Square protests, where he supposedly gave a speech to the Tiananmen uh, to the protesters at Tiananmen Square, which I always say must have been a wonderful speech, since almost none of them would have spoken English, and he speaks no dialect of Chinese. So it would have been a really interesting speech. I'm sure they got allowed out of it before the tanks rolled in, and um, he, then he comes back to uh, Sydney again, and then when Jeff Kennett was elected in Victoria, the Liberal Premier, he moved down to Victoria, along with a lot of other sort of Marxist groups who had been butting there. This was around the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall. A lot of Trotskyists were starting to get a bit desperate. They were banging their heads against a brick wall a little bit. They thought with the fall of Stalinism that their time had come, but things were moving sort of in more, like at that time, more of Francis Fukuyama end of history sort of thing. That's where the culture was more heading. So they really uh, sort of thought that maybe this was their time and they were trying to grasp onto it with both hands. And there was a lot of uh, problems inside most of the Marxist groups at that time. But uh, Jolly came down to Melbourne and um, there was a, they were attempting to uh, sort of restructure the um, Victorian um, school system, which involved amalgamating a lot of schools. And this was very unpopular with a lot of parents and... Jolly tried to jump in on one such protest movement against this in Fitzroy, and the local Labor Party said, ah, we know you, you're a Trotskyist, get out. So he moved into another one down in Richmond, which became a bit famous because they actually occupied the school when it was closed and kept it running by bringing in teachers with far-left sympathies and paying them the dole as a wage. And um, they actually managed to keep the school running for most of a year, which was a gargantuan effort. It was a really like uh, a huge sort of and very impressive uh, uh, effort and feat of organisation. And it was jolly behind most of it. And the fact that unlike most Trotskyist groups, he was actually able, through necessity, because he didn't have a huge activist network, to make links with local communities. He was actually able to dig sort of down into that local community that he'd only just moved to and actually make sort of friendships and... Uh, organise ordinary people in the area, which is something that Trotskyist groups in Australia, who are typically made up of university students with their heads in the clouds, uh, traditionally have a great deal of trouble doing. Uh, um, the police eventually moved in to force Jolly out, and um, the protesters had a very well-organised legal defence and managed to get a lot of money from the state government later through the ombudsman, because the police just came in and beat the crap out of them. And there were a lot of other extremists that Jolly had managed to organise and pull in there. This is just a pattern that you see throughout this guy's life. He pulls people together. Like, later on, he was involved in the uh, Save Albert Park thing, but the Labour Party, again, had already taken under John Brumby, who was then a, a minister, I believe, um, had taken over the Save Albert Park thing and sort of putting it in their own direction. He wasn't able to do much there. But then the protest against Pauline Hanson came along, and he was very much involved in organising buses full of thugs to go down to protests in Dandenong, where the, the famous image of the guy who was simply coming along to have a look and getting completely smashed by anarchists and being laid out on the ground convulsing with uh, foam coming out of his mouth after being attacked by people who were spitting on him and surrounding him. 
Uh, so it's these sorts of things that have been slipped down the memory hole a bit when people start, particularly journalists, start talking about how wonderful the, the far left is by fighting fascism. Uh, it's sort of just how they manage to keep... They, they, uh, most of the groups involved, like Socialist Alternative and that sort of stuff, they still um, congratulate themselves to this day by violently forcing Pauline Hanson out of Melbourne. They consider themselves to have been the main force in stopping her the first time, in their view. Yeah. And, um, but, yeah, it's... Um, so Jolly was involved in... He was on a... With Kerry Ann Kennelly and David Oldfield on a, a very interesting... Um, thing I haven't been able to find the video of it where the, the transcript is up online where David Oldfield's pretty much just saying you're organising groups of thugs to go and attack political meetings people you disagree with how can you say that's possibly a good thing and Jolly's ra rambling for a while trying to justify it and um, then he went on he helped to be a major force organising the S11 riots in 2000 around Crown Casino that was a globalisation conference yeah, yeah, the uh, the globalisation conference back when left wingers were actually against globalism. <laughs> it uh, wasn't wasn't that long ago. It's it's, it's a bit weird uh, to think about it these days, actually. And uh, yeah, he then went on and became a, a very successful counsellor in Yarra because he, in the same thing like with the Richmond High School thing, unlike most far left extremists, he went from house to house talked with people, listened to their problems, and did this every day after work, after he finished work. He's worked in construction and in various other things along the way. And, um, and of course, been a union rep and was uh, affiliated with the CFMEU, back when they were CFMEU rather than CFMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMM
going back to obviously the the 1996 uh violent uh, rallies against uh, pa uh pauline hansen you have to remember tw uh, 20 plus years ago this was the day uh, back in the day there was only the the six o'clock news which showed what had happened there was no camera phones there was no youtube no anything and this is why as you said it's so difficult to get a hold of footage from the time uh, tv appearances and so that's why it's such a a distant memory it's certainly true no internet back then no really ability to sort of keep track of what was going on and um yeah Stephen jolly was organizing buses back during the pauline hansen protest the buses brought up in carlton outside trades hall and everyone who wanted to go and attack the pauline hansen meeting was welcome to come on board so not just members of his own group which even back then was only a couple of dozen people right, he's never had a huge group he's always been an organizer he's always been far more um, influential by organizing on the ground grassroots sort of stuff than actually by having a large group of activists himself which came to a head after the Reclaim Australia rally stuff that we're talking about, where he started the No Room for Racism group, which was by his Socialist Party. Uh, that were the that was a front group for them, and um, that his Socialist Party split very soon after with uh, accusations of a cover up over sexual assault claims in 2015. Don't know how much we want to go into that because if naming names might not be the best of ideas, but it certainly um, it was alleged that a protege of um, Stephen Jolly had been accused of sexual harassment and sexual assault and that the party through their internal structures because they never go to the police they always do an internal inquiry had um, covered it up pretty much and so Stephen Jolly and uh, about half the party left which considering that he'd spent about three decades building up that little party was, would have been quite devastating for him but um, yeah, a little um, later on in um, 2018, so last year, uh, Stephen Jolly and a crikey journalist, whose name I don't know, I can't remember, um, went around to Socialist Alliance and Socialist Alternative, the two biggest Trotskyist groups in Melbourne, and said, we want to start an electoral front with Stephen Jolly at its head because he's the best known elected socialist in Australia and see if we can get him into the upper house in this election that's coming up in 2018. And this was a, despite the fact that he just missed out on preferences from being elected to the upper house in the northern metropolitan area, it was a bit of a raging success. Uh, yeah, thank God. Time... Even though Fiona Patton, uh, she was elected on preferences, well, re-elected, uh, Victorian Socialist with Stephen Jolly as the lead candidate got a higher primary vote. Yes, yeah, about 3,000 more votes than her. And she only just managed to leapfrog them on preferences by doing a um, uh, by doing a deal with the preference whisperer guy, and that was, that was just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, t for a, like context, no full-out communist, which Stephen Jolly is, has been elected to a Australian state parliament since 1950, when Fred Patterson was voted out of existence after the Labor Party in Queensland gerrymandered his seat so that he wouldn't win. Uh, it was, yeah, it's an absolute, uh, and back then they had voluntary voting in Queensland state government as well. So it's just, yeah, it's a phenomenal achievement to have even got close, it's particularly since they probably in a fair election would have won. Uh, but uh, Fiona Patton and Darren Hinch and the Preference Whisperers got together and figured it around. But more to the point, they managed to mobilise somewhere between six and 800 activists, uh, yeah. which... If you went north of the Yarra in Melbourne, amazing. then you just saw Victorian Socialist posters plastered all yeah. around with Stephen Jolly's face. They door knocked um, suburbs in like the far north of the electorate, up around Broadmeadows, Meadow mm. Heights, Coolaroo, that sort of stuff. They door knocked heavily migrant, very poor suburbs that have not seen a politician door knocking around there or even a political party door knocking around there in 50 years. Uh, they they were able to mobilise so many young sort of idealistic socialists from the university campuses and get them out and actually doing something productive towards an electoral campaign, thus sort of radicalising them more, creating sort of social networks and social atmosphere. It was really a, a very successful campaign on their part. And um, it's just unfortunate for the rest of us that they didn't manage to succeed because it really would have taken them to a, a separate level and it would have 
sort of formalise Victorian socialists as an electoral front going forward. Because uh, I, and it's to Stephen Jolly's credit again, you could not get Socialist Alternative and Socialist Alliance to cooperate on anything ever. They are rival groups who hate each other and always have ever since 1995 when Socialist Alternative was created and back then it was the DSP which eventually became the Socialist Alliance um, a little bit later. Uh, it's They've always been rival groups. The fact that he's able to get these rival groups to work together is phenomenal. It's an incredible thing. Yeah. Uh, the man is a, a good organiser, a good yeah. diplomat. You and I, uh, like we... We both despise his his politics, but you've you've got to respect the man that you know over like ever since he came to Melbourne. And it was interesting that there was a a socialist and communist uh, invasion uh, in Victoria because Jeff Kennett became premier. Like he was called a, a fascist and a Nazi uh, at the time, and it seemed back then that uh, <laughs> that there was enough sort of socialist activists who like yeah we've got to you know smash the fasc in in Kennet and of course uh, Jolly he's you know he, he he hasn't been afraid to to use uh thuggish tactics but you know he works he he doesn't take a a government uh well a a, a government welfare or as a university uh, student he's a he's a construction worker works hard uh, every day and then at at night and on weekends works hard to to mobilize actual community support yeah, he went up and door knocked the commission flats in Collingwood. Uh, he went up and down all those stairs knocking on doors, talking to people who could barely speak English and trying to get his message across to them night after night, week after week, with a small band of dedicated and motivated and disciplined activists. Uh, it's amazing. It just goes to show how much all the other political parties have fallen down into this sort of, let's get a sign bite on TV. <laughs> And it also shows just how pathetic all the other extreme left groups are, because all they ever manage to do is um, just continue their same old thing of let's uh, recruit university students, get them all uh, riled up and have a protest in the CBD. And they do that over and over again, have been doing it for 20 years. In some ways, uh, Stephen Jolly is the most dangerous sort of Marxist politician that's been in Australia for many decades. And so this is why I'm very happy that uh, he's just quit or been suspended and then quit from Victorian Socialists. Now, uh, according to the Victorian uh, Socialist uh, press relief, it's, it's over a family violence allegation intervention order. Uh, but a lot of uh, people on who would be on our side have sort of said, like, we shouldn't really be like... Uh, accusing, uh, you know, Jolly and, and going back to the 2015 uh, sexual misconduct uh, allegation because the socialists, they're the, the biggest believers in the, like, the Me Too uh, phenomena. And so by, by sort of, like, because you did a previous article talking about he, you know, sent, he'd sent a text and, um, you know, been been chatting up a, a lot of women that we shouldn't be using this sort of the, the Me Too as... Uh, I, uh, argument or or political pull to to basically take down somebody we don't like because you know basically because uh, I've heard from a lot of people like you know Jolly at the end of the day he's still a man and so you know we shouldn't be encouraging this believe women me too even if it does drag like a, a political rivals down do you get what do you get what I mean? Yeah, I'm sure you've heard that from a lot of people, and I'm sure that plenty of people on the right have said that. And that is why the right continues to lose over and over and over again. It's like being in um, the First World War and saying, we're not going to use machine guns because machine guns are dishonourable and they're very nasty. And if we don't use machine guns, then the other side will stop using machine guns too. Uh, or poison gas or anything. Uh, it's the... You can't win by simply taking the moral high ground and refusing to fight back, particularly when the enemy throws you a gun. Uh, and particularly when the enemy starts shooting himself in the foot with his own gun as well. You don't go over and try and take his bullets away from him. Uh, this Stephen Jolly is a highly effective Marxist politician. Uh, he has managed to actually make roots in the community in a way that no other Marxist politi politician has managed to do in a long time. And in Melbourne, that's dangerous because the more these people get a foothold, the more resources they're able to accrue, the more public support they're able to get. Uh, they've got ex-ABC um, people uh, like Tom Ballard supporting them openly. 
Uh, they've got uh, XABC radio people supporting them openly. Right? Uh, even got an endorsement from Noam Chomsky. Isn't that nice? Uh, they, this organisation of Victorian socialists was probably the most effective grouping together an alliance of um, extreme left groups in Melbourne since, well, a long time. Right? More effective than the Socialist Alliance was back when they were founded in 2001. And the fact that they've just lost their like, main spokesperson and main link to the unions, which is also what Stephen Joy was, which is far, probably a far more consequential thing that people haven't been really thinking about, is also a, um, it, it's a very good thing. Uh, and holding people up so that they get uh, destroyed by their own standards, it's standard Alinsky. That's how you win. Make people live up to their own rule book. Uh, and the rule book of the left says, any time a woman makes an allegation, you must believe her. Well... Someone's made an allegation against Stephen Jolly. And back before the election even happened, the state election, people were making allegations against Stephen Jolly, as you mentioned, with things like sending dick pics and sending lewd messages. For decades, he has a record of this. He is an old-style socialist in more ways than one. Well, uh, ba back in... The, uh, the the old days you know you, you could uh, you know uh, ch chat up women and uh, seduce them without being accused of of rape but you, you mentioned uh, today that uh, well socialist alternative at least they've recruited a lot of like LGBT people from the the, the same-sex marriage campaign and so there's not actually many uh, heterosexual uh, couplings in the modern uh, socialist Marxist oh, yeah. movement particularly Socialist Alternative, they really made uh, hay while the sun shined on the gay marriage thing because they were involved in a lot of the organisation for street protests with the Equal Love group. Every um, Equal Love co-convener and the campaign... That was a Marxist group. group. It wasn't a just a equality group. No, no, it was a Marxist group and it cooperated with the Equal Marriage um, campaign, which was more less street-based and more about organising people higher up in the establishment and older people. Uh, but they ran the university campaign on it. And uh, no, no member of the no campaign actually bothered to point this out because they almost wanted to lose. Now, Stephen Jolly, he's still uh, a Yarra councillor. He's still got that position. He can still be effective. And uh, Yarra City Council put out a, a statement. Oh, what's happened then? Uh, yeah, yeah. The yeah, City Council put out a statement. It went for about uh, 50 words. It was the most uh, interesting statement from an official body I've ever seen put out. Pretty much said, uh, nothing to do with us. <laughs> well, we have had no complaints on our end. Please, please don't ask us any more questions. And Jolly, <laughs> at the council level, he also was the, the trigger for a lot of these, these local councils in inner Melbourne, obviously Darabin and, and Moreland, to, to not hold citizenship ceremonies on Australia Day, move their Australia Day uh, festivities. And that's uh, one of the things that um, uh, Neil Erickson, when he, was, when he was doing things around Melbourne, actually stormed a, a Yarra uh, c a city council meeting. And the Moreland one. Yes, Moreland but, one. but uh, yeah. that was uh, uh, when he got, you know, face to face with Jolly and they, they shouted in his face, shame Jolly, shame. And Jolly's just sitting there with his yep. arms folded, just sort of, you know, not, not reacting. Yeah, probably the most effective thing that, uh, Steve Jolly's, that uh, Neil Erickson's ever done. Uh, those council invasions. I mean, just talking to average normal people that I've uh, been talking to, that was actually very popular. The ones in Yarra Council, Moreland Council has Sue Bolton in it. She also came down to Melbourne when Jeff Kennett was elected. She's been originally from Toowoomba, was working in Sydney and Canberra at the time, tried to infiltrate the Greens as a member of the DSP and uh, is now standing, is now, uh, as far as I know, one of uh, Victorian Socialists' two remaining councils, although Bridget O'Brien with a very close friend of um, Stephen Jolly, and she's on Yarra Council, so she'll probably um, resign from the party as well with him. So we'll see how it goes. So it's basically just a Socialist Alternative and Socialist Alliance uh, uh, left managing Victorian Socialists, which is, it's now just the, the university students, the uh, uh, what, what you'd call the, the socialite socialists, the ones who've been, you know, been to private schools, highly educated, live in the, the inner suburbs. They're the ones who, they probably haven't read much actual of uh, Marx and Engels' work, but they believe that they're the ones who, who are now going to smash the fash. Yeah, 
No, no, probably a lot of them have, but a lot of marks and angles. You can twist stuff like that any sort of which way you want. But yeah, they're um, Bobos, bourgeois bohemians. They, uh, they're the ones who are currently left in charge. And the big thing is the fact that the um, during the state election campaign, um, Stephen Jolly managed to get $50,000 for the campaign from the ETU, the Electrical Union, uh, through his union contacts. And he managed to get endorsements from several other unions as well, all through his union contacts. Uh, that's not going to happen anymore now for Victorian socialists. So they're more of them. They've cut off a bit of their link to the organised uh, union workforce by getting rid of him. But they didn't really have much of a choice. Like you say, a lot of their rank and file and the socialist alternative and socialist alliance um, are very woke, sort of gay and feminist types. And uh, like one of those gay feminist types actually quit the party in disgust, Mia Sanders, in Sydney. She quit uh, Victorian Socialist and she quit Socialist Alliance um, in disgust. And she's the reason, one of the reasons why we have so much information on that internal secret inquiry that was held before the Victorian Socialists uh, ran their state campaign. And back then it was pretty clearly all swept under the rug. Um, Jolly admitted that he had sent the uh, harassing text messages, said he was sorry and that he wouldn't do it again, and they brushed it all under the carpet. Now, the, the local socialists and Marxists, they're hoping to make a bit of a comeback with this a blockade of a mining conference in, in late October, and we've seen the same uh, local council action as well. Jolly's also uh, been involved in, in, in facilitating the, the organisation of this blockade of the, the mining Yep. Uh, conference and they want to make it another they've actually said they want it to be another s11 yeah they've um emma black and sarah garnham both socialist alternative activists have come out they said they want it to be another s11 the entire the entire sort of blockade uh, imark imark is the mining conference um it's in late october 20th to the 31st of october i believe and they want to pretty much just try and shut it down as a part of the the uh continuation of their collaboration with the extinction rebellion group uh, like the Extinction Rebellion it has been brought on as one of the three or four different working groups that they've got in the Blockade OMARC Alliance. And, um, but mostly it's being run by Socialist Alternative. All the posters were funded by uh, Jerome Small, the industrial organiser for Socialist Alternative. Um, the poster runs are being organised by Rida Hassan, who's the younger sister of uh, Omar Hassan, both of whom are of Socialist Alternative Omar. Hassan has, is the administrator of the planning group online for the conference, for the propaganda and uh, media outreach group. Omar is the editor of Marxist Left Review, the theoretical magazine of Socialist Alternative, and he was the one who built up the University of Sydney Socialist Alternative branch, which, and he was part of the organising group that blockaded Bettina Arndt when she was up there last year, I think, or this year. And, uh, yeah, so... The idea that this is anything other than a socialist alternative front is uh, absurd. I'm sure that the the socialists they'll down here in Melbourne they'll they'll continue to make noise and scream and and there'll be a complicit media who who will give them the the sound bites on the news. So even though they're obviously diminished in in resources, manpower, and actual uh, proper campaigning skills, uh, they, they'll con probably continue to run rampant. Oh yes, I would advise everyone listening and everyone watching to keep an eye out for the blockade arm, eye mark thing that will be happening October 28th. If it turns out to be a gigantic thing like they're planning, then you'll know that the Marxists have managed to recover from this little blip. But if it turns out that uh, it's a bit of a flop, then maybe their strength isn't as big as what we anticipated. I'll keep up the great work, Lucas. Uh, I know that you know you're very busy in your own life, but you know this is yeah you're doing some some great work here and exposing pretty much because uh, you reported about the uh, the allegations against Jolly ten months before the the Age dumped that story. That's right. It's amazing when you uh, when you manage to break a story ten months before a a mainstream outlet manages to bother. <laughs> All right. Take care, Lucas. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.